Hello, everyone. Welcome to Palladium Magazine's Digital Salon with His Serene Highness Prince Michael of Liechtenstein. I'm Wolf Tyvey, editor in chief of Palladium. I'm joined by Ash Milton, our managing editor. Everyone. Prince Michael is executive chairman of Industry and Finance Contour Establishment, a Liechtenstein based trust company with a tradition and expertise in the long term and multi generational preservation of wealth, family values, and businesses. Furthermore, he is the founder and chairman of Geopolitical Intelligence Services AG, a geopolitical consultancy company and information platform domiciled in Liechtenstein. Welcome. Um, uh, thank you and, and welcome everybody. And I much appreciate that I can participate here. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for coming on. So we're joined as usual by our live audience of Palladium members. Uh, the conversation will be recorded and rebroadcast on YouTube and as a podcast. To become a Palladium member and get invited to upcoming salons, please visit palladiummag.com slash subscribe. The plan is for Ash, Prince Michael, and myself to have a discussion for about 30 minutes and then move into questions from the live audience. So for the audience, please be sure to use the Q&A function in Zoom to post your questions and upvote other people's questions. With that, we can get started. So Prince Michael, small states have to pay careful attention to their existence in a different way than great powers do. Liechtenstein is one example of this. You've had a chance to analyze and work with states around the world. Um, what would you say sovereignty actually means for small states when they don't have a significant population or military power? What forms does sovereignty take with these small countries? Uh, you know, first, it's important that the population and the people want to have a wish to be sovereign and, right. and, and, and to stay there. I think this is, uh, this is a, a very important. Now, if, if we look at sovereignty, I think there might be in the world just two countries who are probably more than 90% sovereign, it's the United States and China. Right. Everybody else, uh, we are so integrated in the world now that uh, that there is um, that there is no full uh, so sovereignty, and one has to look also what what the neighbors are. Done. It was also in, uh, always in, in, the, in, in the in the history, but um, there are uh, powerful bigger states can um, are probably more sovereign than a country like, like Liechtenstein because everything we do is something which has to do with cross border. We, right. we, we depend on, we fully depend on, on supplies from abroad. Our economy is export oriented. Um, mm -hmm. We work a lot with, with, with foreigners. About uh, a high percentage of our marriages are cross border marriages. Right. Um, so there is, uh, we have to, to copy a lot or to follow a lot decisions of, of other states. And I think we have in generally seen in Europe that even the, uh, the larger uh, countries, let's say Germany or France, they are only medium-sized powers. So they need uh, something like a European integration or a collaboration mm -hmm. to be competitive in the global political plane, not necessarily mm -hmm. only in the, in the local plane, but in the, in, in the, in the, in the political plane. We have an, another way why um, full sovereignty doesn't really exist because there is trade, there is trade all over. One has to be integrated in the global trade. So, and uh, we don't have really f totally free markets in the world. Mm -hmm. I think nearly every country is protectionist in a yeah. different, in, in a different de degree. And, that, and it's easier for a large uh, country to deal with that than, 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 than for a smaller one. So we are actually in Liechtenstein quite lucky to be in, uh, to be in Europe where um, there is now a certain understanding for shared sovereignty. You said something interesting there about the, the reliance of the small country on the larger country. You know, I, I think today um, in discussions about geopolitics, right, there is this view, you, you have to be a hard realist, there is no real cooperation, there's only the defensive power interests. Do you think for a small state, is this a correct view? Or is 
kind of high trust and cooperation actually possible in geopolitics? And do small countries actually have to try and focus on these sorts of um, strategies? Well, I, I think we, uh, uh, we, ha we have to have a realistic strategy that we have, um, that we, we rely on a certain trust that other countries are keep to international, uh, um, to international agreements, mm -hmm. to certain issues of international law of, of, of the, um, <clears throat> of agreements, but we also have, have, have to realize that there are interests. And foreign policy is mostly a policy of interests. And so we have to adapt in, in many things. We have to be like in nature, a small animal has to be smarter and easier to, to adapt than, than, than a large one. Mm -hmm. There is an, today we have a lot of question on multilateralism and bilateralism. Mm -hmm. Certainly for smaller countries, multilateralism is, is, is a bit better because in the bilateral relation, one is always the weaker one. In the multilateral, one is uh, packed in an agreement of uh, more countries and maybe not the interest of just a single one is uh, prevailing. But I wouldn't uh, overestimate that. For instance, we in Liechtenstein are very lucky because we have very good bilateral relations with our two neighbors, with Switzerland and Austria. This is extremely mm -hmm. helpful. But we are also bedded into a multilateral uh, relationship of the European economic area. And these are actually the pillars for us on the, also to support our, our sovereignty. And we have already a history, we have always been part, let's say, of uh, somehow of larger uh, multilateral um, agreements. We were part of the Holy Roman Empire, which ceased to exist in 1806, which was a conglomerate of, of, of many, of many large, medium-sized, and, 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 and smaller states. Uh, we then were members of the so-called German Federation, which then ended with the German reunification. Then we had for a while, and this was a bit dangerous, but. As, uh, as, as the relationship was very good, we had uh, from 1866 on to the World War I, this relationship with the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy, with the Habsburg monarchy. And now we have this agreement with a very good neighborship with Austria and Switzerland, and we are bedded into um, the European economic area. The other side of the coin of that is, that we have actually to adapt most of the rules of the European Union without being able to participate in the decision making on it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the discussions that we've had at Palladium Magazine is about cultural sovereignty. Um, now, as you mentioned earlier, you know, America and China really seem to be, in some sense, the most sovereign countries in the world, we could say. But part of how they exercise this, even China increasingly through cultural power, um, social media is a big part of that. Uh, you know, we, we see news cycles, uh, we see political issues being exported around the world from these countries. Is it possible for small countries now to maintain any kind of cultural sovereignty? Uh, is this even a useful concept? I'm interested how you think about this. I, I think, well, I, I think it is somehow a, a, a very, a very useful uh, concept, but I think it's also the, a question of identification and, and not of nationalism, but of a certain positive way of, of patriotism. This is our home. This is where we, where we want it. We are proud on our system and, and, and we want to, uh, to protect it. And that, I'm coming to, to that later. It has also to do something with the governance uh, structure and the trust between people and, um, and, 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 the, and the government body. We have in our region here also a certain advantage with our neighbors that, for instance, next to us in Austria is the land of Vorarlberg, which is a small sort of a province or a different state of, of Austria, Vorarlberg. The people in Vorarlberg feel culturally much closer to us and to Eastern Switzerland than they would feel to Vienna. 
And the same goes with the canton of St. Gallen on the Swiss side. They also feel embedded in this uh, cultural region and, and, we, and we are in the middle of that. But I think it's, it's very important that people are then in a positive way, not arrogant, but, but proud of, of, of their country and, and their success and that there is a good coherence in the, in the system. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, be, beyond even uh, sort of patriotic sentiments, you know, I, I think about the way that uh, political issues. So we saw this happen with, um, you know, the, the, the various populist movements, even ironically, um, we're, we're seeing it currently with dis discussions about racial tensions, for example. Um, we're seeing it in media, even uh, as, as Chinese money starts making itself felt in Hollywood. There, there's kind of this way that beyond just patriotism, a large country can sometimes hijack the uh, narrative, maybe, or the news cycle of another yeah, country. What um, people are paying attention to. And what exactly, yeah. Important. Defining the political discourse right in a small country. Um, what are your thoughts on this aspect of cultural sovereignty? The, the idea to kind of have sovereignty in your own ideas and discourse, uh, in addition to just uh, culture. I, I think, well, uh, you're right on that. And the, the way it, it is handled in, in, in Liechtenstein, and this is also a, a very big issue for our ruling prince, is that actually the population gets the best of service by the country. And that uh, actually government and, and so on is actually a service provider for the population. And uh, we have an end politics has to be very close to the citizens so that there is really a mutual trust which is existing. Mm. Because the problems we have also with the so-called populist movements or, or, or with whatever, that for instance in Europe, this trust between government and people is, 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 is not given anymore. That means, you know, less and less people are going to vote. Or if they go to vote, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a protest vote. On the other hand, government more and more controls people because they don't trust the people anymore. And this is very dangerous for, um, uh, for democracy and, and, the, and, the, and the free society. Um, of what is the advantage uh, here in Liechtenstein, even as the country is very small, also the different municipalities have a high degree of autonomy. And um, for instance, each, the citizens of each uh, municipality can decide on their taxes, on votes. Mm -hmm. And uh, taxes are perceived not by the country, but by, by the municipalities. Um, then our municipalities have also the right by a process, an organized process over three years to declare their let's say, independence from the state of Liechtenstein, which forces the government to give really the right service, because otherwise one municipality called over others say, no, we don't want to be part of Liechtenstein anymore. We are joining Austria, we are joining Switzerland, we are making an old state. It's, it's very right. unlikely, but, but there is this pressure fund. And I think for a small country, it's very important that this mutual trust between and uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, a, a government and, and the country is is given, and let's say in uh, in, in Liechtenstein, the um, the institution which is most approved actually by some ninety percent of the of the population is, is the ruling prince himself mm. and, and, and the system. But but there is also a much higher in. I think in, um, compared with most OECD countries, it's the highest trust in government, uh, if, if you look, and also in the parliament. So that uh, this is, I think we can only keep what we call, we might call it cultural, or institutional sovereignty is by really having a high degree of trust. And also to know that government is accountable to the people, and, but the people are not accountable to government. Mm. Do you believe that it is possible to rebuild trust like that once it has been evaporated somehow or abused? Well, I think we have a crisis of trust. And uh, what I believe is, what the problem is, 
that we are getting more and more centralization. A more mm -hmm. federal and, and, and decentralized system uh, is much closer to the citizens and, and it's much easier to establish trust. And what I observe in many European countries, but I think it's global, that we have a move actually from a decentralized democracy towards a more centralized bureaucracy. Right. Mm. And so, this doesn't inspire trust. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so Liechtenstein's been around for a long time and uh, you've got the ruling dynasty that you're part of that is sort of a very long lasting institution itself. Um, but in, in sort of the modern world, a lot of institutions, both public and private, seem unable to think and plan on that long term. Um, even the economy seems quite distorted and, and short termist a lot of the time. So I'm curious your take on what's necessary for an institution to plan and succeed over the long term. Uh, well, I think the institution, it, it is like a little bit also like in, um, in, in, in business. You have actually to see what is the customer expectation, but in the, in the positive way, not an expectation like, say, like an overboarding welfare state, but how can you give a long-term benefit uh, uh, to the people? And I think it's very important because institutions frequently like to grow and to become an end right. in, and, and in itself, that the institution mm -hmm. is there for the institution. So it is always a, a very important to constantly rethink the institution and adapt it to the, uh, to the necessities. Right, so how, how do you keep that discipline of, of staying small and adaptive? Like it, this, uh, this problem has sort of been put as the, there's problems of succession there, there's problems of, of how do you sort of keep it uh, run by sort of a live player, someone who's able to actually rebuild the institution and, and adapt it this way or that, um, while at the same time kind of also keeping intact that discipline of, of kind of keeping your eye on the ball on, on what is your fundamental strategy and staying small and, and lean in that. So I'm curious, like what are the actual um, strategies or, or ways of thinking that, that lead to that? Well, I think what, what is important is long-term thinking, objectives, being close to the citizens, uh, uh, being closely accountable, but, and being honest, mm -hmm. being a, a, a very clear saying also um, recognizing when there's, there's a mistake or, or an error, but, but being, having long-term objectives and, and being un honest about that and, and translate it so that um, uh, people can understand it. And this is much easier in a small entity than in a large one, because in a, in a, in a small entity, everything is much closer to the person, the person can understand it much better. I think this is why also larger countries, which are very federal and very decentralized, are normally much more efficient than the, uh, than the, the very centralized ones. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to hear then if you think that large companies and large states have similar ways of failing. Um, you've kind of already mentioned there are some similarities here, but you know, in... in our, our economy as in our politics, right? It seems like a lot of companies even are very short-termist um, in how they're governing themselves, just as a lot of countries are. Um, what do you think the similarities are there? Like, is it even possible to have a large company that manages to stay long-term thinking? Well, I, I think uh, you, you can have large companies uh, which are, have long-term thinking and, and, and large states. I think that the companies normally, which are long-term uh, very successful, are also quite uh, decentralized and put, uh, um, and, and put let's say, more um, responsibilities to lower, in the lower degrees of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, for, 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 for instance, you know, I've worked for a long time for Nestle, the food company. 
Mm. And there we had, in the, and Nestle is a very global company, <laughs> and we had in the different markets a very high degree of deciding what is best there. And to adapt, we had certain uh, common rules, which were, was mostly principles uh, and, and, and some ethical and management principles. But otherwise, in the decision of how, how to adapt the product mix, etc., cetera, the, the, the financing, etc., was really done, was really the responsibility of the local managers. Mm. And I think in large uh, countries, for instance, I think the democracy, which works very well for the longest time, is Switzerland. Switzerland is ex extremely decentralized. There is the federal government has only very few responsibilities. It's now getting also more and more, but actually very few responsibilities. The main responsibilities are with the cantons and the municipalities. So the decisions are very close to the citizens. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you rule a country like, let's say, Germany, 80 million people, if you're the chancellor, you have very little contact with, directly with the people. And not everybody can say. When you're the prime minister of Liechtenstein, you have to walk on the street and everybody can approach you and tell you, and, and, and tell you what their problems are, what, 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 right. what they like doing, and, and if they feel that uh, the government is doing something wrong, they say very directly, and this is very disagreeable. So, uh, so, so you have to, to be very close to the citizens' long-term interests to, uh, to be able to, uh, to prevail. And, and you know much better what the citizen wants. Mm -hmm. So to pull out a common thread here, I mean, you mentioned sort of this principle of being very honest about what you're doing, what your failings are, what your strategy is, and so on. Also, this principle of decentralization, making sure that the decision making authority is is uh, all over the place and especially sort of pushed down towards the local. And both of these principles seem to um, they go towards making sure that the knowledge of how to run the thing and what it's for and what it's doing is, is pushed out towards uh, the, a larger mass of people. So there are more people who know what's going on and more people who understand it and more people who know how to make it work. And this would make sense to me why that would yield kind of a, a more robust institution in the long term because one of the key problems is the succession problem, right? How do you replace this like a highly centralized operation centered around you know a few people when they retire? No one else knows what was going on there, especially if they weren't being honest about what they were doing. Everyone else has the wrong story about it. It's very hard to replace that. Whereas if it's very honest and there's many people doing similar things in parallel at a local level, then it's much easier for for that to be robust over the long term. I'm, I'd just be curious to hear. Does that sound like the right? Uh, sort of principle to, to pull out of uh, what you're saying here with the honesty and the decentralization? I, I think for me, it, it's an important principle. And I think it can also be done in, in larger countries. You know, it's very difficult. Let's say, let, let, let's take again a country like uh, Germany. It's very difficult for the citizens really to understand the foreign policy. So it's quite good that that is in the central government and that, that it, it's being done. But, uh, Issues like, um, uh, but, but, but there are a lot of issues which can be done on municipal or on land or on, on, on province basis. And this is much easier for the people to understand. And it's also more important for, um, more, more important for them. And so they feel a lot more involved if it's done more on the local level as if it's done on the central level. There's another thing I think which is very important is the internal competition. You shouldn't harmonize everywhere. You should help that you should have a competition towards excellence between not a fight, but a positive competition towards right. excellence between municipalities, between regions, or like in the United States, between the, uh, the, the, the states. And they know in the, in the region much better what is good for the region than the central government knows it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this gives a much, uh, uh, it makes you much closer also to the people and people are much more involved in, into politics. 
Yeah. So and, and stand behind because they feel they can influence something. Mm -hmm. So one one type of institution that we don't talk too much about in America, but is very prominent in Liechtenstein, is uh, family dynasties. So uh, this seems to be throughout history uh, a very prominent feature in many societies is that you have people passing down social position and responsibility and knowledge through uh, family dynasties. And they seem to be some of the more long lasting institutions. So I'm curious to hear um, how should we be thinking about, about family dynasties in relation to these questions of, of uh, you know, institutional long life or institutional functionality, uh, things like that? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I think there is not, uh, there are many systems in the world of, of, of governance, of institutions, mm -hmm. etc. And I don't want to say that one is better than the other one. I think it right. has to be really adapted to the different local or regional necessities. Now here we have, um, in, in Liechtenstein, we have, well, it was always a monarchy, but you know, the monarchy has also to adapt. And um, uh, you know, when we, um, we decided in Liechtenstein about 20 years ago on a new uh, constitution. And this was an adapted by, by a public vote. Uh, and there, the, 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 the prince has said very clearly uh, that um, there should be a possibility to discontinue the, the, the monarchy if it doesn't look fit anymore. But it should not be done by a revolution, but by a democratic process. So our constitution has a democratic process, also over three years and two votes, that the people could, let's say, abolish the, the monarchy. And he said that also uh, requires that uh, whoever is the monarch does makes the best out of his job and out mm -hmm. of his duties. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, obviously a kind of familial monarchy is a very obvious formal way that families will tend to hold political power. Um, in America, we have this, you know, there's this interesting situation where we know that there are these families that are dynasties, you can think of the Kennedys or the Bushes or the Clintons, yeah. for example. Um, but, you know, family structures for a lot of the population have changed over the last 50 years. Um, I, I think for a lot of uh, people, not just in America, but around the world, families are no longer so stable as they once might have been. Yeah. Um, however, among people we could maybe call the governing elites in a lot of countries, it's interesting to me that families actually still seem to be much more stable. I wonder if this means that maybe rather than families not being an important form of power or influence, what's actually just happened is that we have forgotten how families operate as institutions. I, I wonder if you agree that we underrate the role that families play as institutions, even in America, or, or do you think actually, you know, it's, it's good that we've gone beyond this as a, as a norm? Yeah, you know, I partially agree with that. I think that the, the family is, is, is a very important part, the, let's say the most important and stable part of, of society. That's why also that the families got weaker is not necessarily uh, a, a good for, for our societies. But, 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 it, but it's of this, um, uh, in this era we are living, it, it, it is a fact. But I think the important thing is to have the notion of responsibility. Hmm. And if a family has, it goes by the example of the parents to the children, because you educate your children not necessarily through school, but through the uh, um, example the parents are giving. And if they have a notion of responsibility, they are much fitter, I think, also to govern than if they don't have this, uh, this inherent notion of being responsible for something. Mm -hmm. It goes the same for uh, wells. You know, a family which sees the wealth as a responsibility rather than an entitlement is much more likely to keep on the wealth for generation than one right. who just sees it as an entitlement. 
Yeah, so this, this gets us into the question of succession and the, the kind of culture within families or within institutions of, of how to actually achieve the, su the succession of principles and, and succession of strategies from one generation to the next. So, I mean, we've talked about decentralization. You've just mentioned this, this certain sort of culture of how you're thinking about your power and position as a responsibility. Um, are there other aspects or other things that we should know thinking about uh, how institutions need to be preparing the next generation to be taking over? Like there's, there's always some next generation that should take over unless it's a very short lived institution. Yeah. Um, and, and actually making sure they know what they're doing and making sure they have the right attitude about it and making sure they, they're able to actually pick up those responsibilities is, is often quite difficult. I'm curious if there's anything else that uh, you could offer on that. Uh, you know, I think in institutions, it's very important that they don't become bureaucratic. There is also a notion that the older generation gives to the younger ones who are coming up, and that's not necessarily state institutions. You cannot uh, have necessarily just the family dynasties in there. There have to be people who come from, from all parts of the population. But if mm -hmm. that, <coughs> if there is in the institutions really the breeding, actually, we are not uh, a, a hierarchy and, and, and we can govern and we can give orders, but we are responsible to the population. We are responsible to, uh, to the state and we have to, be, to do the best one. This is the way how, how you can educate your succession. Mm -hmm. So there's a trade-off perhaps between bureaucracy and responsibility, uh, one could say. I would say because in the bureaucracy, uh, the, um, I'm not generalizing a bit, uh, mm -hmm. I apologize for the general, but in the bureaucracy, the, uh, the, uh, the most important principle are the procedures. And you can, if you follow the procedures, you don't have responsibility. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you need to decide, uh, you, you, you need to have a responsibility to, to give the best of services and not to hide yourself behind bureaucratic rules. Life is much easier for, a, uh, for an official institution to hide between bureaucratic rules because then he has no responsibility, etc., and it's fine. And at five o'clock, he can drop everything down and go home. So if it's less bureaucratic, there is more personal responsibility. And, and there the, uh, the person is also, uh, he has the challenge uh, to try to, to do the best. And there it should also be a, co uh, a certain healthy competition that the best people are making their career and not necessarily uh, let's say the, um, uh, the the one who knows the bureaucracy best, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah, the people who are actually sort of being most creative and and useful in their role. Uh, I'm seeing the time. I think we should probably uh, jump to Q and A. Um, so we've got a few questions coming in from the audience already. Uh, you you can keep just a reminder. You can keep asking questions in the Q and A box. Uh, and please to make sure to upload your favorite ones. Uh, and then we can ask those to Prince Michael. So our, our first question comes from Miguel. Um, and so he asks, how does the royal family in Liechtenstein remain coordinated on the same page uh, with regards to how governance uh, operates there? So, you know, you've already talked a bit about um, the importance of decentralization, the importance of being close to the people of having a sort of relationship of trust between state and population. Um, but I, I think it would be, you know, given that Liechtenstein has a much smaller governance and has a royal family, um, are, are there ways that you can uh, talk about that the family as such, or perhaps the family in relation to the, uh, the state, the government, has, you know, is able to remain coordinated among these decentralized parts? How, how does everyone keep on the same page when governing? Uh, well, you know, I, I don't think one needs to, uh, to, to keep on, on the same page, but I think there is again the notion of, of, re of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And in normally, in the, in the political way, the only uh, person who is really uh, treating with government is, is the ruling prince himself. 
For instance, uh, a, a person like myself, I have to be. I have to look for my own life. I don't inherit anything. I have to build up. I became. I became a businessman. Now I'm involved, but not because I'm a member of family, but as a businessman in, in certain of the professional institutions here in the country right. and, and order. But this has nothing to do. So towards the the, um, the, the state, it's just uh, the ruling prince, and that's normally goes on to the uh, uh, to the eldest son. But there are certain mechanisms, and there there is the obligation also for education with responsibilities, etc. It's actually for the whole family that is uh, this educational and example uh, responsibility. It's, it's expected. It's not always possible to achieve it, but, but, but it's, it's respected. But there are mechanisms if the ruling prince or let's say the eldest son should not live up to, um, to let's say, to the qualification, the expectation they would have um, to make changes there. Mm -hmm. My understanding is, is a mechanism as a mechanism inside the, 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 the uh, inside the family. Right. So my understanding is that the succession is actually, you know, it's not instant. It takes, you know, it, it takes place over a period of time. There's a slow transfer of responsibility. So I assume that this kind of ensures that, uh, as we're talking about earlier, right, the, the successor, one of the common modes of failure is the successor doesn't actually know uh, how all the mechanisms, all the institutions work. Um, I, I, I would assume then slow succession, the goal is that there is a succession of all the knowledge involved. Yeah, uh, you know, if, if I look uh, sort of on, on present day Liechtenstein, and I think we were uh, very lucky actually, the, the oldest son of the ruling prince was always one of the most qualified persons. And mm -hmm. let's say that uh, the, um, the Prince Franz Joseph, who died in the, um, uh, around 1990, already about 20 years before, uh, he had his eldest son uh, acting as head of state under proxy of the father. So the two work together and do it. And we have the same because now actually the uh, the, uh, the government function is done by the hereditary prince, not by the prince himself, because he had passed it on for a while. So, 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 so there is a, 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 a floating way of, of, of passing it on. Has there ever in Liechtenstein's history been a failure of succession? Uh, fortunately, we, 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 we never had it. And this is oh, lucky, wow. but, but there are the provisions if there, there should be. That, um, uh, that, that, that there are uh, corrective measures possible. Right, right. Well, I bet it's a remarkable, especially in Europe in the last 200 years or so, that, uh, you know, given the various conflicts, everything happening across the continent, um, you know, I, I, I've read before about some of the families in Florence, for example, that have managed to uh, kind of maintain themselves through centuries. And, you know, one thinks of wars, revolutions, unification, etc to survive all of these historical events isn't, uh, you know, it, it's not something that just happens by luck, let's say. Yeah. Uh, Wolf, do you want to feel the yeah, next sure. question? Yeah, so um, you mentioned making sure that the government is a good service provider. How do you determine which services are the most important to citizens when developing those priorities? And how do you evaluate success of service delivery? This is asked by Jeremy. Uh, you know, one side again, decentralization, that the citizens can uh, have already quite large influence on what happens on the municipal level. And mm -hmm. I think the, the other way is being close to the citizens, but also having a very long-term view. And I think this can be done by the principle, you know, this is, I think, an advantage of a monarchy uh, because they don't have to be re-elected every four years. And here in Liechtenstein, it is actually mostly the long-term visions for the country and long-term view is a lot developed by the, uh, by, by the ruling prince and, and his advisors because they don't have to think towards the next election. And the execution is, 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 is done by the government, but they are also thinking, uh, thinking quite, quite long term. So it is on one side, closeness to the, uh, to, to the citizens, 
on the other side, really taking a, a long term view. Mm. It seems like, you know, one of the common features of a zombie hierarchy or a zombie bureaucracy is, uh, you know, the procedure becomes the end rather than the mechanism. Right, um, yeah. I'm wondering in, in Liechtenstein, you know, how in the system of subsidiarity, how much freedom does a, you know, a responsible head uh, have to kind of make exceptions, for example, or exempt a procedure that doesn't seem to apply in a case like this? Like, how much personal freedom is there in leadership? You, you know that they, are, they, they have a, um, certain parameters in which they can decide. Well, mm -hmm. they, they have to keep to the laws as long as, as a law is there, it, 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 ha, it, it, ha, it has to, to be kept. But sometimes one finds out that a law doesn't make much sense or it, it, it doesn't have, or it's not thinking. It is much easier here than to change. This has then to, to go, into, if it's, let's say, a law, which doesn't seem very applicable, it will be noticed, and then the parliament, and the government should propose it to the parliament to change the law, to adapt the law, etc. cetera. But, it, but it's, it's much easier because people can grasp the different cases easier. Mm. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next question here. So Zach um, is interested in your comments about education. Um, so he's asking, you know, what does education look like for the royal family? I'm actually going to expand this question a bit. I'm interested in how uh, Liechtenstein as a whole also thinks about education. Um, and, you know, what, what might be some of the differences between how someone in the royal family is educated versus how a regular citizen is educated? I don't think there is much uh, difference, you know, our children and myself, we go here to the public schools, etc. So, so this is, mm. uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the school education is, um, is the same. But I think in, in education, generally, the most important thing is again in the family. Mm. And the example, the, uh, uh, the parents are given to the children. And um, actually in our family, but in many Lichtenstein families as well, it's very important uh, that we learn the notion of self-responsibility uh, and self-reliance. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we, we, we are responsible for, uh, for, for our, our life. We should not necessarily go to, uh, to, 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 to welfare or to trust. We really have to um, live our lives to grasp ourselves opportunities um, uh, to do that. So that I think the education is not uh, much different to other ones, uh, but for the thing which I was always said, well, they said, well, you have this name and, and you're a member of the family. So it's also your duty already as a child to give a better example. Mm. Yeah. To work well, maybe harder, to, 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 to work may, may, maybe harder, harder to, uh, to, to, to study and to, be, um, and to behave respectful, very respectful to other people. Mm -hmm. One of the things that impresses me about the um, education system in Germany today, for example, is the focus on apprenticeship. Um, so, you know, in, in the trades, it's very apprentice focused. But I think even in the gymnasium, in the university stream, um, there, there's kind of a much more almost classical approach. I think we, we would see it in North America. A lot of Western countries, though, are under this older Prussian model, right? Mass education, mass curriculum. Um, the, the idea is kind of to make a uniform citizen. Uh, do you have any thoughts about uh, how successful has this idea of education been? Uh, has it worked or has it failed more? I believe very much in the apprenticeship. I think this is, uh, this is very good. It's very helpful for the young people because they are again coming back to the question of responsibility. They, they see, they, they learn responsibility already very young. They see the, uh, they, they, they see the real world. But it's also quite interesting for the companies. I always have in my, in my business, I always have a number of apprentices. And mm -hmm. it is very interesting also to listen to them because they, are, they have sometimes a very open mind. They are not shy in criticizing certain things. Does not everything they say is, is the right thing. 
But they, they think about it, and also the company can learn a lot of that. So I think it, it is an extremely good system to, uh, to, uh, to, to educate people, to educate the, the next generation, and, and, and to have a really, um, I, I would say, task-oriented, job-oriented people, and less, uh, and less on zeroes. Right, Let, less curriculum. I, I, I saw um, this phrase recently, I, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but by the time something becomes a curriculum, it is already outdated. Uh, it sounds like you're, you kind of have a similar sentiment here. Yeah, this is frequently the case, yeah. Mm. So on, on that general subject, uh, Charlie Aubrey asks, you've spoken a little bit about the succession of knowledge, institutional health and families, um, and, and now about sort of uh, training these young people, apprenticeships and so on. How do you see the challenges facing the younger generation today and the particular knowledge that they need to be acquiring right now? Are there particular challenges for young people in Central Europe? What would be your advice for those starting adulthood today, particularly those entering a career in politics and governance? Uh, well, I think the, the, the challenges, which is the, the biggest one, but I think it's also a huge opportunity is that our technological um, possibilities are expanding. Mm -hmm. So actually, with, with all these technological possibilities, our, the impact one single person has increases dramatically. But this is on, on one side. On the other side, let's say the other side of the coin is that you have constantly to follow the progress. The moment you have learned something, you have already to start the, 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 to learn the, the next thing. So it is for, for the constant learning, the challenge is, is much bigger, but it makes also life much more interesting and, and you have more opportunities. So what, what can I say to these uh, young people? They should uh, have, um, they should not lose their curiosity. And I think this is, a, this is a very good thing to be curious, to be excited uh, by new things, to follow that and, and, to, and to apply it. I think the chances which we have now are enormous, but it has also the other side of the coin that it might be for, uh, for certain people also, also too much. But I think everybody can find his niche. And I think it's important that people don't have over expectations, uh, you know, and that people really try to do jobs which they love. It seems like in a lot of countries right now, there is almost a failure of succession between the generations, right? So especially in, in America, there was this post-war baby boom generation. Um, you know, they, they were very successful. They were very materially prosperous. Now we, we have, you know, the, the, the succeeding generations, especially the millennials and the gen, generation Zs. Um, and, and there's a feeling that uh, they will never achieve the same state, the same wealth, the same success as their parents and grandparents did. Um, and, you know, we've discussed here at Palladium before how much of the conflict that we see today is in a way an expression of this failure to succeed between generations. Uh, I'm wondering, do you agree with this um, way of thinking about things? And do you think that a solution exists at this point? Uh, well, I, I think there is a, there's a, a very dangerous trend that we need... Um, there's a very dangerous trend that certain people are giving up and are saying, okay, um, this is all too, uh, too, too, too complicated. I don't want to, be, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get into that. The other thing is, of certain people, I think we also expect too much because not everybody can be a, a big manager or, 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 or can, can be this and that, but might be, be very happy with other ways. And I think we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a transition period. And it's the unfortunate thing that in a transition period, there are, all, there are frequently people who, let's say, stay out of, of, of the process. Unfortunately, it's becoming now a bigger part of the people. Very important will be 
that we get into really fit and efficient education systems. And education systems which are adapted. Not necessarily that we have everybody going into Harvard and having a, a highest education, but we start with a primary education which, uh, which is more adapted to what um, uh, people uh, really need. And I think that our education systems have become too bureaucratic. Can, can you expand a little on this? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, when I, and, and I know I, I, I have to, to expand on that. I think we have to have much more variety and much more, I would also say, competition in the education system. We have in most European countries, we have this primary school education system. And this education system was very good for the, uh, for the, uh, for the 19th century, where we had industrialization, big armies. So people were really educated as a disciplinary task in, in, in certain things that they needed to, uh, to know. For instance, working in a factory, working here and there. World has become a lot more complex now. And so I think we would not need to have one education system, but a number of, of different choices which are, uh, which are competing already on the, on, the, on the primary level. Right, so kind of different tiers, different career routes, maybe very importantly, even different um, status hierarchies, right? Like a master of a trade versus a, yeah. a, a, a graduate or professor of a university. Uh, yeah, you know, we, we have certain, which is quite interesting, it's maybe the, not the right comparison with, let's say, affluent and, and more highly educated countries like the United States and Europe. But for instance, in India, the state education system is not very good in primary. And there, there are a lot of private schools for poor people. And this is a teacher who makes his school and people pay something. In our things, maybe one dollar for, for a year of the child. But for them, it, it's, it's a huge investment. But this teachers, and then their parents will see that their children are getting to the best teacher. And so there's a competition between them and they have to give a very good service and adapt it to the children. Now, mm -hmm. we can't do that here in, in, in our areas, but I think more competition there would be, uh, would be very helpful to to modernize and to adapt our education systems. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So, yeah, there are these voucher uh, systems, for instance, where right. people get vouchers by the state, etc. And I'm a, a big advocate of that. Great. So, Jeff Anders asks You spoke of people in bureaucracies hiding behind rules. It's tempting to hide behind rules, especially when one is in a highly politicized environment where the media and the people are not. Uh, going to be understanding of failures. What do you think is the most plausible way for us in the United States to depoliticize our discourse and make it safer for people to take personal responsibility? Uh, well, I, I think this is one of, one of the biggest tasks we have. I can't talk about, about it in the United States, but, 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 but looking again at, um, in, at, at Europe, I think it's again, it might seem that I'm repeating myself. It's one thing, it's um, um, it's a, the, the, the more decentralization. Then the other thing is, how can we get people uh, more motivated and very qualified, responsible, and people with vision to take political jobs? At the moment, it's, it's not very attractive because actually you have to be some sort of a saint to be a politician. Because you're not allowed to, to, to make mistakes, one watches what, 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 what you're eating, whether, you know, whether you're smoking cigarettes or not, etc. You, you are more and, 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 and more restricted and, and, um, and, and, and you're criticized for things which has nothing to do with, 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 with your job. So, so it's not very, uh, very, very attractive uh, for that. We have also, I don't know about the, 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 the US, but in Europe you can frequently say that the top people are coming out, polit politician has become a job and not a vocation. And so people make career, they make career in a, in a party, and, and this career system also leads to a certain mediocrity. 
because uh, you are, if if somebody is 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 to, is to God, there are um, uh, there, there, there are jealousies. So so we have systems that um, um, not necessarily the, the best ones are, are going uh, are being the right for, for for the job. So I think uh, we should really more look uh, first uh, look that. Um, Coming back to one, if we look at, at the parliaments in Europe, most parliaments, being member of a parliament is a job. People depend on their salary as member of parliament for, 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 for their living. So they will not necessarily do which a member of parliament should actually act and decide on the best of his conscience. But then you, you look, okay, how can I be reelected? And sometimes you have, if you have a, a strong opinion, uh, you have to get it through if, even if, if, you're not, if, if, if you're not reelected. So I think we should have much bigger penetration, let's say, between the private sector and politics. Uh, if somebody from the private sector gets into politics, you should not, and, and if it's, let's say, a successful business, you should not harass them too much on their investments because there could be something here and there. I, I think in making this job of politician, giving more responsibility and making it also more, uh, more, more attractive, not necessarily by higher salaries, but really more possibilities to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I suppose, though, the, the concern uh, behind, you know, th things like investments is how does one ensure that uh, even a talented person is sort of aligned with, you know, the, with the state or at least with the responsibilities of governance? Um, do you think that there are ways beyond high trust that one can ensure this? Or are things at the end of the day based on personal trust in these kinds of networks? I think a, a, a lot, a, a lot is, is based on, on, on personal trust. And I think it's also good if we get people in politics who have made already some successes or some work in the, in the real world and not always having been as a servant of the parties, mm. which is unfortunately very much the case in Europe. Right. Um, I would like to get to a couple more quick questions before we end. So, Prince Michael, perhaps you want to give very quick answers for these ones. Um, we have a question from Chris. Uh, so, you have an interest in life extension. Um, Chris asks, you know, can you discuss this interest a little? Do you see it as a technological solution to encourage long-term thinking or to overcome problems of succession? Uh, or or does your, is your interest just more personal? Well, you know, if I look at, at a li life extension, what I'm looking mostly has to do something with, um, uh, with, with health. Actually, what I'm looking for, actually not necessarily to extend the lifespan, but the health span. We have mm -hmm. a problem now with, uh, you know, we have now a life expectancy of more than 80 years. But a lot of people, the last 20 years of their life, from 60 on, they have the chronic diseases. And, mm -hmm. they, it, and uh, they have the chronic diseases. And I think it would be good to find ways already younger than by more healthy life, not creating the basis of chronic diseases. This is one thing. The uh, spate issue for, for, for that is that simply with the aging population which we have, we will not be able anymore to afford the healthcare cost for this and uh, for people being 20 years, let's say, having chronic diseases uh, before they pass away. I want everybody to have as long a life as possible. Right. Uh, so the biological a aging. And, and a healthy and good life. Mm. And the second thing is, which is nothing, you know, at the moment in Europe, once they were 65, you should retire. And, um, I think, and we, and we can't uh, afford the pension costs anymore. So this, this is an, another way. On the other side is, I think I'm very much against this uh, time of 65, because certain, certain people want to work longer. And if we, if we get away from the thinking of 65 and retire, uh, we could also, we would have more people taking, let's say, a second career after 55. Mm -hmm. 
I could talk still for hours about that, but this is, let's say, the short answer. Sure, sure. No, I, I think that's a, an interesting perspective on the, the political interest of, of slowing down biological aging. Yeah. Um, I will end with uh, Michael's question, though. Uh, Michael asks if you have any book recommendations, anything that's been influential for you or that you'd recommend to people thinking about leadership, responsibility, society, and these topics we've discussed. Uh, well, I think there are some um, quite um, uh, quite a, a good one. I think one which is quite important is Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, because this really explains how, how important self-responsibility is and not being sort of subject to, to, to the state. It's actually a manifestum for freedom and responsibility of, of the citizen, which is very good. And I think in politics, one of the best books now in international politics is by Christopher Clark. He's an Australian historian called The Sleepwalkers, who explained to us how by uh, actually non-responsible uh, working and taking the easiest way out, the world got into World War I, which was totally unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't there also a book that was written by the ruling prince in Liechtenstein currently? Yeah, uh, the he, state he in the third millennium. I think this is very, it's called the state in the third millennium. And he makes actually, um, uh, this is, uh, let's say, a sort of credo for small state, hmm. uh, for the state as service provider, but he also talks about other issues, how he sees the education systems. And I can very much, and I wanted to as a third one, recommend that because it, it goes into education in the way the state is organized, in the way of responsibility, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right, so for anyone state interested. In state in the third millennium. Yeah, okay, so if, if anyone is interested, uh, if people want to follow up on the topics we've discussed, um, there's a few, uh, some good recommendations there. Wolf, I'll hand it off to you. Great. So I think we're just about out of time for the digital salon. It's a little bit shorter than usual today because Prince Michael has to go. Um, Prince Michael, many thanks for joining us. This is a very interesting discussion. No, uh, thank you very much. And thank you also your audience. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having the patience to, uh, to, to listen to me. And for me, it was a pure pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, th and special thanks to all of our Palladium members um, and the audience for the great questions and support. To become a member and get invited to upcoming salons, visit us at palladiummag.com slash subscribe. Remember to subscribe to Palladium Magazine on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at Palladium Mag. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.